I'm very pleased to be here. It was Alex who got in touch with me some time ago <clears throat> about talking about George Douglas, who was my uncle, an uncle by marriage. Uh, and he certainly was an extraordinary person in our, in my, our area and with our family. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about him this evening and about the place that he lived, a place called Northcote Farm. It really wasn't a farm in the ordinary sense of a farm, um, but it was a very special property, which is now thanks to a very caring person who knew the property himself when he was much younger and has now been donated to Lakefield College School. And a great many things are going to happen to that property, good things, um, because there's been so much that happened there over the years with George. So I'm going to be reading some of his letters to you uh, and his comments. Um, and we've got slides up here, uh, not slides. I'm of that generation of slides. I know that this is PowerPoint. And I will um, try to make them side with what I'm talking about at the time. There are 25 pictures you'll see. Um, that's just the hundred years different from what we saw this morning, all the other presentations. These were all, all most of these pictures were taken um, probably in the early 1900s. So, um, the title is George Douglas Empowered by Northcote Farm. And he was in an extraordinary way. And, and somebody just said to me today, someone who knew him said, the water was his highway. And that's true. The rivers and the lakes that he knew were indeed his highway. And it didn't matter whether that was in summer or winter. Um, he loved the water. So I'm going to begin this narrative with George's recollection of the family's arrival at Northcote Farm in 1883. George wrote a tremendous number of letters to people all his life. His father, Dr. Campbell Mellis Douglas, had attended the American Canoe Association meet at Stony Lake in August. By chance, he spotted a for sale sign on a boathouse in a narrow stretch of Lake Ketchewanooka. The setting and the buildings were of so much to his liking that he bought the property immediately. He broke the news to his family, quoting a passage from Gilbert and Sullivan's play, Patience. Now I am a man of property. And he was indeed then, for up to that time, the family had lived in England, Halifax, Quebec City, Toronto, and all was in rented quarters. George recalls the house had been sublet furnished at the time of purchase, but unfortunately it was empty on our arrival, and they arrived in October of that year. Luckily, the little steamer ferry had pulled two scow loads of Halifax furniture and father's beautiful sailboat, the Mini. And this furniture was mostly mahogany and of great quality and not very helpful with a young family. However, they got on the family and domestic help included a North Country nurse, an Irish American cook and a Barnardo girl from Peterborough as a maid. Well, the Yankee woman, and the nurse quarreled incessantly. And George says, by spring, mother had sent the nurse back to England. And during the winter, Dr. Douglas, who um, came and went a great deal at Northcote Farm, as you, many of you know, his main interest was designing and building um, uh, canvas canoes, uh, folding up kinds of boats. Um, so he was quite often away doing things like that. But that particular winter, he had arranged to do a series of lectures at McGill, and so he left his family in this new property. However, uh, the original owner had left a great deal of farm equipment, so that certainly helped. George's schooling began while he was there at Sheldrake School, which is now Lakefield College School. There were about 25 boys, he and his brother Lionel would paddle or snowshoe from the farm down to the school. That was about a mile going through the woods on an old, old Indian trail. And in good weather, they drove a horse-drawn bamboo cart. And both boys became comfortably at home on and in the water and skating in winter. 
In spite of the never-ending chores, inside and out, life at Northcote was exciting and educational. However, Dr. Douglas really couldn't make a living out of this, the odd medical call that he'd make, and his boat building, and the boats that he tried to sell. So he decided to take the family back to England, where he could return to his army regiment as a half-pay officer. And George and Lionel were slated for the sea. So that was part of one of his early recollections. Um, in 1906, George wrote to Professor George Wally, um, who, as you know, wrote a book about Hornby. And he wrote to Wally about his early years. And he said, a complete uprooting to England and apprenticeship in one of the um, work build, shipbuilding uh, companies. And that was work mixed with extensive travel by land, on foot, and by bicycle. That was with his father, actually on rivers, by canoes, and by sea in a sailing boat, and then three years at sea as an engineer to get his papers. Then in 1900, another complete uh, break in what he was going to do. He wasn't sure whether he wanted to stay in England or stay in North America, and his James Douglas relatives, who were in the copper and silver mining field, asked him if he'd like to work uh, in their power plants, in the gas engine and power plant operations. So he did. And he writes to Wally and says, um, so I left England and then a complete break to a remote place in northern Mexico and in charge of gas, and, and, uh, gas engine and plant operations. And he was all over the country. It wasn't just in Mexico and just Arizona. Two years of incessant travel, supervising construction and operation of similar plants. And with this intense activity, my health broke down twice. Only a retreat to Northcote, which came into my possession in 1907, saved me. And then he mentions the copper mine. After the copper mine expedition, which I had expected would be continued, I was sent to my old job. And in six months, was on the edge of another breakdown, which I forestalled by temporarily quitting the company and making a retreat to Northcote in 1913. Um, and I should move on to some of the pictures. We'll see what's next. Uh, when he got to Northcote uh, in 1907 um, and gradually moved in for a short period of time, the people that came to visit him were members of um, I was going to say the gentility of Lakefield, but they were. They were English people who had come out to Lakefield, um, and he enjoyed them. They came, that's George the back leaning against the veranda post. So they came, and they'd come for tea, and they would talk about um, what he was doing and what they were doing. In a further letter, he states, I hadn't liked England at first, but there were some compensating features, surf wallowing, which is what they apparently called it there. For instance, it was more exciting than running on the logs, and he's, he and Lionel certainly ran on the logs in Canada. And one could get equally wet at it, and sailing the Alice on the North Sea was almost as interesting as sailing a, a Peterborough canoe on Clear Lake, though it was less precarious. Smell of continental pine trees when returning to New York was enough to make me realize the difference between Northcote Farm and Weybridge, England, and between the Thames and Clear Lake. Obviously, George was very, very committed to the time, the early time that he'd been at Northcote. George was highly attuned to what he called the conditions, uh, which was his term for weather. And, he, and I can remember this so often as a child. He'd come down to our house. We lived on a, a farm not too far away. And my mother would say, George, what are the conditions today? And he would tell her in, in quite a number of words. George wrote letters to many people that he met in his years in the North. And as many of you probably know, P.G. Downs was the last person that he met in the North in 1938. And in this letter, one of his many letters, he evokes the country atmosphere that he absorbed at Northcote. He said, I hate to leave here at this time of year, which is the winter, which I always find the most interesting of all the seasons, the change from autumn to winter. 
I've told you how I lived here as a boy, aged 8 to 19. Northcote was a well-run establishment in those days compared to its present condition, and the life was truly an ideal one for a boy growing to be a young man. I was fortunate beyond most of my opportunities for seeing different parts of England and Scotland, and above all, the different ranks of English society, which he didn't particularly like. Um, I didn't like any of it except the countryside, and I was fearfully homesick for the old life I'd known in Canada. My father had sold this place, and that it should ever pass into my hands again, and that I should look on it as my home for over three times the length of time that I lived here as a boy was beyond my wildest dreams. In fact, the possibility never even remotely occurred to me. I used to seek relief in Thoreau's books, The Diaries of the Seasons, and his Maine Woods, which had always been a great favorite with me. No doubt you have read these besides Walden and Cape Cod, etc. Thoreau certainly had a profound effect on my mind. Some of his books that I have, the, the very good ones, are in a um, in special collection at Trent University. <clears throat> but there were a number that were left of ones that he read, and he usually wrote his name and the date and where he was, which is really useful if you're trying to do any sort of biography about somebody. And on that trip, on the beginning of the copper mine one, when he was taking the train out to Edmonton, he was reading Walden, so he was back to Thoreau for good feelings. Um, in 1900, when this was when George had finished his uh, work at sea and he had to decide what he wanted to do. In 1900, he accepted the offer of James Douglas, who was a first cousin of his father, to work in the Arizona powerhouses and gas plants. And he often took shifts for those who didn't show up. When he became very tired, James Douglas suggested that he go east for several weeks. George left on July 3, 1903, and he spent 12 days with the James Douglas family in the Adirondacks. They were a very wealthy family and very helpful to George. They had a, a lovely house up the Hudson River in an area in, that was called Spate and Dival at that time. And they also had a camp in the Adirondacks. From July 16th to the 20th, George rediscovered Northcote Farm and its environs. He wrote a long letter at that particular time about what it looked like, and he hadn't been there since 1894 when they left uh, Northcote. In the 1903 diary, he writes, I saw the new Peterborough lift lock, nearly completed. Took a train to Lakefield, they have three a day now. Got a skiff from Gordon, and I rode to Northcote stepping over the logs in the back bay to take pictures. George was an amazing photographer, and those of you who've read Lands Forlorn or any other of his material, you know the, the kinds of pictures that he took. And it was the James Douglas family, one of the daughters, who really taught him photography. And I should move on with more pictures. Okay, talking of logs, these, this is right opposite Northcote Farm. This is an amazing picture, um, and it's one of the ones that is in um, the National Archives. Uh, they do have some of his photographs. Um, and that really filled up that part of Lake Ketchewanooka for several weeks, if not months, before the logs went through. Anyway, when he got to see it in, in uh, 1903, he says, the place has changed a great deal. The house is painted white and the fences have changed. The poplars have grown much, the upper boathouse much the same, though somewhat dilapidated. I took some pictures around the veranda. Next day, rode up to Juniper Island and visited cottagers. Clear Lake, very pretty, lying calm. George always rode or paddled or sailed. Uh, later, when he did get back to Northcote for a period of time, he bicycled. But the water, as someone has said, was, really was his highway. By July 1907, George had decided to buy Northcote Farm in spite of his father's disapproval. After attending a scientific conference in Toronto with his cousin James Douglas, he went by train to Lakefield and made his usual rounds to the canoe company and seeing some of people like the Tate family and others. His diary entry for July 25th states, 
I paddled and sailed to Northcote Farm. A perfect morning, saw Jones there. Jones was the owner at the time, but wanted to sell, and talked about purchase of the place. I offered 2,500, and this would be for about 90 acres. Jones suggested 3,000. I had lunch, leaving him to consider the offer, and I went off to Young's Point, and I saw Addie and Andrew Allen. They were the great help that the Douglases had they will turn up here at some point. Uh, this is looking at the house, uh, uh, probably from a boat. Um, it's a fairly narrow there, but that, I think, is... He must have been out in a boat at the time. So there are the poplar trees he was talking about. And one of the early pictures has the house looking pretty bleak. It was brown and not much around it. Uh, but the house still stands, and virtually all of the buildings are still there after all these years. That was built in 1878. Um, and Addie and Alan, Andrew Allen, and they will somewhere here. Um, that is, that is, is a picture that's in, a photograph that's in Lance Forlorn. That was his favorite view. That's a, a lovely ridge. Um, I think it's a drumlin. If there's a geographer still around here, they'll tell me it is or it isn't. Um, but it's, it was a nice hill. It was a hill that all of us learned to ski on. And the poplars were beautiful. And unfortunately, they have died away. Anyway, he saw Andrew and Addie. Then he walked to South Beach, which was part of the very end of Rice Lake, and saw some friends there. And I turned back, I went back to Northcote, and we settled on 2,700. Jones noted that the house had been painted and two hardwood floors had been laid using butternut lumber from the farm. Jones was glad that George had brought the property, and he said, and I thought this was an interesting sentence, he said, it would be a great pity if it were turned into a regular farm. And I think Jones knew that George had this wonderful love of the water and boats, and that was what he was going to do. And George's only comment at that, at the end of writing of that particular day, is, well, Northcote Farm is mine. And so he's got it. Um, the following day, he met with Judge Langley in Lakefield to sign papers. He said goodbye at a garden party, and then he headed back to join the James Douglases again, uh, spending several days in the Fulton Chain of Lakes in the Adirondacks. And we have some photographs, they're not in this, but I have got them somewhere, um, of George um, handling the, uh, I can't remember the name, of what the Adirondack boat is, that long skiff, the very pretty skiff that you row. It's a, Thank you. <laughs> okay. Later, George had a busy summer in England and Europe visiting power companies. This is still 1907, including meeting, meeting Dr. Diesel of the diesel engine, who appeared somewhat suspicious about George's inquiries. And this is uh, prior, of course, as we know, to the First War, and they were beginning to build various armaments and developing power. And that may have been one reason why diesel was not very forthcoming. He, but the few weeks that George had over there in the summer, he and his father paddled and bicycled many times. But already George was beginning to plan expeditions from Northcote with his father and his stepbrother Bryce. <clears throat> Back in Canada in mid-November, he made a 24-hour trip to Lakefield, where he talked to Richardson and Thomas Gordon at the canoe factory. These were the superb canoe makers of the time. Uh, George absolutely admired their work and bought many, many canoes from them. He went to Young's Point by buggy on a cold, blustery day over frozen ruts. The day ended with a cold sleigh ride to the CPR station in Peterborough. That was just a day that he went up just to see what it was like in the winter. So we move to the next year, um, and these diaries, by the way, I was fortunate to get these one way or another, um, and we have about eight of them, and then little notebooks where he would write things, lists of things, and temperatures over the years, or the, the depth and the height of water. He was an extraordinary collector of information. Um, and moving then to June 1908, it's a different scene, it's summertime, took the Grand Trunk Railway from Blackwater to Peterborough, 
uh, had a good room at the Oriental Hotel, and then on Saturday, got a skiff again from Richardson, had a fine sail to the farm. Andrew Allen was there, got all my things unpacked, repacked, finally straightened out. And I think oh, he'd already taken some things to Northcote. Now he was finally getting them there. And I slept on the veranda. George, um, I'll, I'll come to this, what I want to say about that picture, but George had 56 days at Northcote that summer. So he had a, a good break from the work that he did in Arizona. He paddled and or sailed every day. And I read that particular diary very closely um, and just to see what he did do every day. And he did. Uh, he would paddle to Lakefield. He'd go up over the locks at Young's Point and then carry on to the end of Stony Lake and come back. And he just did this day after day. Uh, so he paddled or sailed every day. And his biggest pleasure was the discovery of his father's very old canoe the 1854 Harmony, a beautiful canoe that is in the Canoe Museum, uh, the lovely one that has had been given to him by George's father. It was given to George's father when he was just a youngster. Um, and in his diary, he says, took her out, saw Gordon, who did not remember she was there, that's at, at the boat uh, livery in Lakefield, and I bought her back for $5. He ordered a new basswood canoe he named the Polona, a 15 and a half foot flush, foot flush batten basswood sailing canoe, which became a favorite for Northcote Farm and some later property that George had on Clear Lake. George had a remarkable first summer at Northcote as its owner. Two fellow workers from Arizona spent some time working at the power plant at Young's Point and they all worked together, putting the Harmony back in floating condition. And she'd been in dry dock, so to speak, for several years, so that took a while. They camped on vacant islands, they entertained, they traveled on the steamers, and enjoyed the company uh, of Lakefield friends. Andrew and Addie Allen lived at the point, but they worked regularly for George, uh, as they had for his parents. Initially, George expected to live at Northcote for only the spring or summer, from the beginning, he gave Andrew explicit instructions about use, the use of land, of clearing brush, cutting trees, and making repairs. He, he was very careful about how the place was going to look. He said to Andrew, I want to get fixed up to entertain friends in a properly comfortable fashion. Addie agreed to housekeep when necessary, though George noted, I can get along very well with very little when I'm by myself. With friends, I need everything up to the mark. And he was a very specific person. Whatever he did, he, he did it well. From June 19th to the 26th of July in 1909, he continued to order canoes and paddles. His main objective that summer was to bring a frail half-brother he had in England. Uh, he wanted to bring him to health. Um, and a canoe trip was a way to, to bring back health in, in George's mind. And that picture should turn up. A, Maybe I'll, I'll go through these in a row, I think, in a few moments. Uh, George was a strong believer in fresh air, physical exercise, and attention to nature. He was very uh, conscious of everything in nature, whether it was the animals, uh, birds, uh, what was in the ground, very, very caring about it. He began to read about the North, though, by this time. This is 1910 or 1909, rather, and the explorers. For 1910, he planned a canoe trip with his father on the old voyageur routes. It was not, unfortunately, it was not to be, for his father died of cancer <clears throat> at the end of December in 1909. George, very saddened by his father's death, and after spending a few days with the James Douglas family in the Hudson River, he decided to check out Northcote Farm in the winter. Okay, and I'm down to five minutes. Um, so, uh, there was a, a, and this is January 1910, uh, he went up to Northcote, he never, hadn't been in there in the building in the winter, fell through the logs, he walked up the logs in the back bay, had a cold job changing in that cold house, and what I changed on, on or into, I don't remember. Northcote was not equipped in any way for winter then. Walked to Lakefield, to the canoe factory, ordered another canoe, uh, another four of them, and had dinner at the hotel. 
And then skis that he had ordered arrived, and there he is on the skis. Skis were, skiing was practically unknown in Canada at that time, he writes to a friend. I was unable to get in the in Toronto and had been obliged to wire to a sporting house in, in Chicago to send them by express. These were very poor things. They weren't, certainly weren't up to his standard. Uh, no harness of any kind. They were made of pitch pine. I used a wide leather strap over my toes and a flat strip on the ski just behind the ball of my foot. This is quite a good rig when skis are for, used for straight travel. So that's what he had, and he used those a lot. This is the um, uh, my name, Harmony. My mind has just gone blank on that. <clears throat> um, and that's at Northcote, a beautiful, beautiful boat. Um, there we are with this brother that he, who, who looks very frail, but he did survive. They went on a long camping trip. Um, they've got all the <clears throat> gear lined up there on the veranda. Uh, and there he is, that's one of the Adirondacks ones. He's looking quite snappy there with a suit and cap on. And sailing at Northcote. Um, they had a number of canoes. Uh, by the end, by the time um, they, by the time he had left, and we started, I, I started going through notes, discovered he, he and his father had over 50 canoes uh, and a couple of other boats, uh, and they all were named. Every one had a name. And there he is, um, George enjoys doing, going that kind of paddling. There is a passenger in the front, probably a young lady, Perry's Creek at Young's Point. Uh, very adept at that. That's one of the houses. That's the tool house, of the old log cabin that was built probably in the 1850s. And they lived on that. Uh, however, George um, <coughs> did have a breakdown at uh, about 1914. When he got back, he was trying to work on the book. That was difficult for him, <coughs> Lance Lorne. He found it very hard to write. <clears throat> um, and he tried to sign up for the war, but because of a hearing problem, they didn't accept him. So he did a 40-day stint in the winter at a little cottage that he bought. I don't have a, a picture of that. He bought property on Clear Lake, where Clear and Stony meet, and he skated every day for 40 days, and he got over his depression. So uh, that may be one way if you're uh, having a bad day, maybe just find 40 days in an unheated cottage and go out skating. You never know what it'll do for you. So they, what they did over the years, they stayed in different places. Uh, he married that summer in 1917, married my mother's sister, <clears throat> and they would spend part of the year in this, what they call the tool house. Um, and visitors would come. This is George's sister-in-law who came out one year with her family uh, doing the laundry there. Um, and people from the Grove School would come up. Uh, and if you had tea, you just pulled up a box or a large stone or something, and you sat on that. And wonderful conversations. That, that, that was, I think, one of George's great attractions, because he, um, he could talk about a number of things, and he loved to hear what other people said. Um, and there he is with, that's the last uh, building that he made. And he called it the floater, because she obviously does and she sat on a wharf, usually just tied up at the shoreline, and I have no idea what they were going to do there, but they have one of the folding boats and a tent that he'd taken on the copper mine expedition and my aunt, so they were heading off somewhere. Uh, and there he is with Denny Lenoz, my aunt is there with Denny Lenoz. Um, P.G. Downs came to Northcote, so did Denny Lenoz and several others, and he wrote to them all the time as well. Uh, and there he is with um, oh, uh, the um, Gwyneth Hoyle, if she's in the audience, will call out the name because she wrote a history, a story of him, a biography. The um, um, land surveyor, um, and that's on Clear Lake. So they would come to visit George. And the, the, I love this one. This is the duck pond on the lake, and it's about the size of just this front area here. And this extraordinary group of people have all come up from the school, the Grove School, and they're all just standing there on their skates. I don't know if they're actually going to do anything. Um, and there's P.G. Downs. 
he is feeding the, um, the, a bird that came for about 10 years, a partridge, Patrick the partridge. Patrick was very clever. He would tap on the window in George's study um, and he would be given a biscuit, but he waited until he had seen the cats go in the house and then he knew it was quite safe. Uh, and Downs came several times. He and George had a great relationship. They were very, very different in their personalities. Uh, and I love this one. This is uh, how you skied about 1935. Um, I'm just pondering whether you're going to go down the hill or not. Uh, and that is the ultimate picture of George. That's George in his study uh, with the pennants from the trips that he took in the 30s, little objects from who knows where, um, and he's reading something quite large. And there he is, uh, probably five years before he died. He, he didn't lose any height. He lost strength in his arms to some extent. Um, and he was, some, he certainly lost a good deal of his memory. I don't know if it, if it was Alzheimer's or just simply aging. And I think he was 86 when he died. But, um, okay, I have to stop, but I just want to say that this, Northcote was an extraordinary place, and it still is for a number of people. And because so much of the material has been maintained or retained, uh, and people like me and others in the family are trying to put it all together, there's a great deal more of the story to tell, but I wanted to tell that much, and there we are. Thank <laughs> you.